My name is Jane Stewart. I'm from BizSafe and I'm working with Joe from Responsible Cafes Network to put on this online series of Cafe Summits. Stronger Together is the name of it all. Um, before I start, I always acknowledge the, um, that I'm sitting on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It's also important starting a, a, a summit like this about being responsible to acknowledge that our First Nations people have never ceded sovereignty of the land and that they still have a really strong and enduring connection to country. So today, before we get into it, I thought I'd do a very quick recap on what we've done in our three previous events, just to remind you of the content we've covered so far. So our launch event was all about really setting the scene and really um, making the point that now more than ever, we really urge you to continue your responsible cafe journey not just for the benefit of the planet or the community in which you operate, but because it makes good business sense. Our first action summit was all about introducing new ways of thinking. And we looked into circular economy thinking and design thinking, and we had some really great speakers to really tease out those ideas and think about how you could um, implement those approaches into a cafe. We heard from some cafe leaders and we saw how that they were actually putting some design thinking into their production and their sort of cafe operations as well. Our second action summit was about new ways of doing. And you might remember that we categorized these new ways of doing this under five key themes, action themes, purpose, performance, procurement, planet, and people. So last week's summit was very much focused on procurement. And we looked at a whole range of supply chains, particularly around coffee and around food systems. Um, we also listened to some really great cafe leaders. And again, they were telling us about how they had created really great relationships with their suppliers and how they were sort of working together to innovate for their supply chain. So today is our third action summit. And again, we're looking at the impacts of, um, hello there. Can I get you to turn off your video, please, Samantha? So today's our third action summit. And it's all, again, it's all around new ways of doing. And it's, we're looking at the um, issues of, people and planet. We're going to start by looking at the environmental impacts of a cafe. Then we're going to explore milk alternatives. We're going to look at compostables and what that story is all about. And I'm just looking at our speakers. And unfortunately, we have a really wonderful speaker. His name's Ian Price from Y Waste, but I think he might, might not be able to join us today because he rang to say that he, um, because of all the flooding, he has no power. So he said he might not join us. Um, we're expecting that, so we won't be having him today. But I told him that what we might do is record him at a later date and drop that into the, to the online version of what we're doing. So just so you know, we're recording all these and you can catch up with um, what we're doing at a later date. And we will put Ian into that version of it too, because he has a really great story and it's all around food waste, which is obviously a really big issue, but he might join us along the way. So that's all right. So first up is Dr. Adam Carr. So Adam is the resident coffee expert at Seven Miles Roasters. Adam is a chemical engineer who, when he discovered the application of his experience in the coffee industry, decided he'd never look back. So Adam uses his skills and deep love of coffee to improve the understanding of coffee science and technology and disseminates this through the Seven Miles Coffee Science and Education Center. As part of his commitment to continuously improve the coffee experience, Adam says he's continually designing experiments to test the latest gadgetry and how to make the best coffee. So Adam, we met you, hi, how are you? Hey, how's it going? Good, thanks. We met you in our first launch summit and that was fantastic because you really um, told us a little bit more about some of the research you've done on the Cafe Trends 2025. So I encourage you all to go back and look at our um, first launch event to see Adam and, and discussing the Cafe Trends because it's really interesting. But today we thought we'd dive a little deeper and look at the environmental impacts of a cafe in more detail. So can you give us a bit of an overview of what the biggest environment impacts of a cafe is? Yeah, yeah, sure. Look, you don't mind, I'll just quickly share my screen because I've got a little, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little something here that um, might help. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm not sure how everyone here is familiar with life cycle analysis, but life cycle analysis is effectively a, a way of measuring, I'd say, the, the inputs and outputs of any particular thing you want to look at, in, in, in our case, a, a cafe, and looks at what's called a cradle to grave analysis. So basically, I don't know, an example I often give is you look like a bacon, you, you look like a bacon and egg. If you look at a bacon and egg roll, right, I mean, at its core, it's got bacon, it's got eggs, 
Uh, it's got a bread roll around it, but each of those things has a supply chain that, that builds it and it has an end of life where it decomposes ultimately into going back into the atmosphere or wherever it happens to decompose and what it decomposes into. It's, you go down rabbit holes everywhere you go. So you know, when we look at it, for example, a bacon and egg roll, we find that in terms of the CO2 footprint, it has double um, the mass of what a, what a, literally you weigh a bacon and egg roll, it may weigh 500 grams. It has about a one kilogram CO2 footprint, um, you know, looking at the whole cradle of grave analysis. And that's because you're looking at, you know, the farm that the pig was raised on, the kind of feed that it had to do, you know, the amount of energy it takes to raise a pig and then to, to, to butcher it and so on and so forth. And, you know, it gets a bit grim, I suppose, if you really, but again, that's the rabbit hole you have to go down into yeah. to come yeah. and get a, an accurate number. Um, so we did an analysis around a, a cafe, a, a coffee shop, um, a typical coffee shop, and we did it on a 100 kilogram of coffee served per week basis um, to get our final numbers. But, you know, you'll see um, that these, oh, saying beep, beep at me, uh, you'll find that these, um, they scale as a percentage. Um, so again, to give you an indication of what we looked at from a life cycle analysis of the things going into a coffee shop, we took into account coffee, milk, food, water, um, packaging, power, equipment, and a whole bunch of other things. But these are sort of the major inputs. Uh, and as a part of the outputs, we looked at a bunch of things, um, including uh, solid waste, disposal, um, the coffee waste, food waste, um, every kind of waste you can possibly think of. Um, and so we looked at the inputs and looked at the outputs, and then we looked at the breakdown of the top five, uh, I guess what the top five CO2 footprint emitters were um, of a coffee shop. Um, and so we, we broke it down into this. So the first and by far and away largest um, footprint in terms of CO2 basis of the cafe was the electricity that's used to power the lights, yes, but for the most part, it's the power required to heat and boil water in a coffee machine. That may sound that may sound silly, perhaps, but if you've done any work around water, and I've, I've done a little bit in my past, um, water is a very, very energy intensive material. It's one of, the, one of the highest heat capacities known to mankind. It takes a lot of energy to heat up water. And the amount of throughput of water going through a cafe to heat water from 25 to 93, and then to boil it um, to be 125 degrees, one bar pressure, 1.5 bar pressure, it's huge. Um, so anything you can do to minimize the electricity consumption, particularly around the espresso machine, um, you know, you can see that a small 1% difference in that will have quite a big difference in terms of the whole pie, um, yeah. in terms of uh, your environmental footprint. Um, milk, and this is this is traditional sort of dairy milk. Um, milk has, you know, takes up the next biggest chunk, about 27%. Um, of the carbon footprint of the cafe. And again, it, it's not so hard to see why. I mean, a lot of people probably are relatively familiar that, you know, meat, you know, the meat industry, and I guess, you know, by the way, milk's not as bad as the, the meat industry generally, but it's still quite a, quite a, you know, quite an intensive footprint. Um, it's still a cow. It's still a cow. And then you also think, yeah, exactly. And it takes <laughs> a lot to raise a cow and yeah, you're not, you know, it's a, it's a sustainable process in a sense. A cow keeps producing milk, although obviously not indefinitely. Um, but yeah, no, that's quite huge. But then also you recognize that most coffees that are drunk in Australia, 80% of them are, are flat whites and 80% of a flat white is, is milk. Um, there's actually a huge amount of milk that goes into the cafe industry. And I think it's about four times in terms of a, a mass basis, there's four times the milk going into a cafe than there is coffee. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a sort of a scale type thing going on there. It's almost like they're milk bars rather than coffee service. But again, I shouldn't say that I'm for a coffee roastery, but you know, it's, that's the truth of it. Um, wastewater, believe it or not, applies to the next biggest factor. So that's the amount of energy required to, amount of energy and the chemicals and the whole balance around making sure the water is not so toxic when it's pumped back out into the oceans and also a portion of recycled water. Um, so wastewater, and actually that's including dish soaps and everything you chuck down the sink. Um, that's got a surprisingly heavy penalty, um, followed by food wastage. Um, and again, it's a funny one, you know, food waste, I've been to a number of summits that look at food wastage and it's, it's a huge, um, mm. food waste has got a huge impact on the environment. When you consider that it's only 7% in a cafe and most of the money made in a cafe is from food. I mean, you get to see just how big the rest of that pie really is. Yep. Um, and then, you know, you know, the reason I did this study at the beginning is I was, you know, I was, 
I'm going to say skeptical. I'll say the word skeptical. I, I, I saw that there was a lot of stuff being done on, you know, the war on waste on, on paper cups. And I was skeptical that there was all that much waste in it. Um, and this was the result of what we'd done. And it's part of, part of the inspiration because I was skeptical. In some ways, it's not a bad way of starting a study. You can convince yourself or not convince yourself whether something's big or not. Um, I convinced myself global warming is actually a bigger thing because of this kind of a study. Um, much bigger than I thought it was initially. But, you know, again, while cups are only 0.5% from what we found from our life cycle analysis of the problem, it may be worthwhile taking in comparison how big this real, this, this piece of the puzzle is in terms of the entire coffee supply chain. So uh, I looked at, you know, so the first phase of the studies look at a cafe and coffee shop life cycle analysis. We then put that into perspective and saw, okay, well, that's, you know, that's the percentage breakdown, but how big is the cafe? What, you know, in terms of the part of the problem, you know, look at the entire coffee supply chain from literally where the farm goes to the end of life and the transport, you know, where does it fit in comparison to the rest of those things is actually a small blip or is it actually big? And the three major, so the six major categories that we, we published um, a little, a couple of years ago, the SCA, we did a presentation in the SCA here about this. The three biggest emitters um, from a Swiss eco point basis, which is kind of takes into account, not just carbon dioxide, but to, you know, aquatic toxicity, terrestrial toxicity, um, water usage, and a whole bunch of other things like that. Um, you know, sort of what we call resource scarcity. Um, and we find that cultivation, transport, and the consumption phase, that is that what happens at a, effectively at a cafe, um, they're the three biggest categories. Cultivation results in about a 2000 Swiss eco point total. Um, and most of that, the, the vast majority of that is through fertilizer usage. So organic- Can you explain farms. what you mean by the metric you're using? Oh, and it's Swiss eco points. So again, Swiss eco points is a, it's, so tons of carbon dioxide is one metric for, you know, um, I guess environmental impact or negative environmental impact. Swiss eco points takes that into account, but builds into it um, uh, toxicity. So if you pump it into the oceans, how many fish does it kill? Um, terrestrial toxicity, um, you look at uh, eutrophication, so basically runoff of fertilizers contributing to basically the death of little of micro ecosystems, among other things. Um, wow, okay. Basically, anything you mean, you, pu you put uranium, you're spreading uranium on your on your field. You're probably not going to want to be in that field for a while. It puts all these things on a common basis and says calls it an eco point. Okay. Um, so, and that 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 total is normally a um, it's it's. Uh, you weight different factors according to, you know, climate targets that you're trying to, to go ahead with what you actually know to be true, you know, whether people can live there for a long period of time and if it's going to you know, kill people. And there, there are a lot of different weightings and factors in it. So mm -hmm. this is the, this, I use the traditional Swiss eco point. So what the Swiss government would, would mandate for, for their own, and that's pretty tight. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so that 2000 point basis, you could, if you want to think of it as tons of CO2, you can, to be honest, most of the Swiss eco points are made up of CO2. Mm -hmm. um, for most of these categories, but for cultivation, it's eutrophication. Um, and that's because of all the fertilizer that's used and then where it runs off and eventually where it goes downstream. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's that. Transport, which I thought would have the biggest impact, in fact, doesn't. It is the third biggest. Um, but far and away, the cafes have, you know, it's almost 20 times more impact <laughs> than the next biggest category. So basically, and when you think that 53% of that is in the energy used in your espresso machine, you've got to think to yourself, you know, <laughs> you know, and again, when I talked about that thing before, you know, a lot of people, I think when we talk about, you know, only 0.6%, you know, disposable cup, you know, is it really a problem? When you look at a, a graph this big, 0.6% of this probably accounts to, you know, only a little bit less than what the complete transport costs are. So again, looking at scaling, um, that's sort yeah, of where yeah. it goes. So again, that's what we found from our life cycle analysis. Um, and so with that knowledge, I mean, part of our job as a part of my job, I guess, as roasters to help educate people as to what it is that they can do to minimize their footprint in each of those different broader impact category um, areas. So, you know, milk, be it milk so, reduction, milk changes, you know, you name it. So, so is um, is that the end of the slides now? Has you got another one? Yeah, I only have three. That's all right. If you want to turn that off now, I'll have, a, I'll have a, just a bit of a chat about all that now. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, I, I remember when I came across this research, when I, was, when, when I was preparing for this summit and thinking about, you know, what could we talk about and 
who could we get along? When I read this detail of research, I just was blown away and thought, wow, I haven't seen this as it relates to a cafe before. And I think it's such a good, um, it's such a detailed and comprehensive look at it. So there's no, you know, guessing, there's no assumptions. It's, it's fantastic. But what you've said is pretty technical. And I suppose it's really what I want to tease out now is, so you're saying that the, when we're looking at the impacts of a cafe, we're looking at all the inputs and the outputs, and then we're looking at the, um, the carbon emissions and what elements of those. So you've pretty well explained what that is, but as you were just about to get into, so if, if milk is sort of the second largest contributor mm. to greenhouse gases, what, what, what are you saying is the alternatives? And, and yeah. we have an interesting speaker coming up too. So <laughs> yeah. tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I guess for me, when you're looking at trying to minimise the footprint, there are a few different options you've got available. I mean, one of them is to try and minimise what you've got. I don't think substitution is really going to work. Well, I shouldn't say that. When I say substitution, you can't you can't just straight up take milk away from from the Australian coffee market. People probably you know you probably won't have very much a sustainable business. So you've got a few options available. One of them is to try and reduce the amount of milk that you use um, or waste. Um, so they're two different things. Um, one of them is actually serving smaller portions of milk in your coffee, and the other one is using automated systems that can actually contribute to not allowing you pouring as much milk down, literally down the sink. Yeah. We find that on average, about 50 mils, for every single coffee served, about 50 mils of milk is poured down the sink. Wow. Um, automated dosing systems, you know, can save you a huge amount of not just, you know, milk down the sink and, you know, environmental penalty, but also money. Um, you know, minimizing waste doesn't just have to be only a, it, it, you know, it, it should be built into the psyche. Minimizing waste on every single metric is a, is a thing that should all be, should be, should be pretty high priority. Um, what, so that's one about- of them. Yeah, go on. What about when you're you're talking obviously about energy consumption? Yeah. What about some really practical actions that cafes can take to reduce that? Yeah, well, I mean, apart from you know implementing automated systems such as like the Juggler or even Uber Milks, I mean, they can precisely dose milk systems, and that will that will literally save you fifty mils every single coffee you pour, and mm-hmm. that's that's actually quite huge, and that'll yeah. save you about that'll almost save you about five percent that whole wheel. That'll save you about a fifth of it. Wow. Um, you could also switch to a different kind of milk, I suppose, or you can increase your presence of alternative milks. Alternative milks do have a measurably lower impact on the environment. Um, though some milks, and you know, I know, I know we've got another speaker after this, we'll talk to a bit more of this, I think. Um, but some alternative milks aren't, are better than others, I would say. Um, I'm not, I won't just say not just in taste, but also in terms of the actual measurable impact on the environment. But I mean, you know, I won't, won't, won't go into detail on that, but that is also a possibility. And I suppose there's all the the usual things we would say around running your building and your the cafe itself, there's all those ones as well. Oh, yeah, like turning machine off overnight? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a simple one. I mean, if you got, we found that there was a break-even analysis. If you have four hours between your next service, you will actually save money and you'll save genuine, genuine you'll genuinely save on power costs of your machine. Um, so if you've got four hours, if you're finishing up at 3 p.m., definitely turn your machine up, off before the 5 a.m. the next day. It's, it's a no-brainer. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a whole lot of different things that you could do, but uh, I think yes. those two and those biggest impact category, they're, they're the two yeah. biggest things you could do. Mm-hmm. Okay. We, we, we're actually going to go into a bit more detail later, but that sort of gives us a good idea. And you can, all those who are listening, you can see, I, I almost call Adam Dr. Coffee because you know this so well and you've given it, you've looked in it to it um, and, and really researched it. So I encourage you all to go to Seven Miles Coffee Roasters because Adam has put up all this information as blog posts and you can read it more carefully and really see what he's been talking about. So thanks, Adam. That was a really great, really detailed analysis of the impacts of a cafe. Cool. So thanks Thank very much. Um, just quickly, it's Joe here. Um, do your cafes um, turn off their coffee machines then, Seven Miles? Do they have a um, system that turns them off? How does it work? No, we've looked into that. Um, it's a lot of cafes that... say they don't, they don't want to do it. That's, that's why. No, so some of the machines we have have an eco mode built into it and that halves the amount of energy used at idle. Um, and that actually has a huge positive benefit. Um, there are plenty of people scared of turning them off because they're worried that with all the heating and expansion and contraction, the machine will you know, pop yeah. overnight. And that has actually happened to some people yeah. before, but normally that's some very old machines. So anyone that's got a machine three years or, or newer, we always recommend doing so. Um, and again, we, we don't own the cafe. So when we have to, we can only advise, we can't, mm. um, but you know, we do, you know, this message has gone out to, to all of them, so. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Adam. That was fantastic. 
So as you say, we're, we're just about to talk to now to I was, I say goodbye to you. And before we welcome our next guest, I'm actually going to play a video for everybody. So let me just do that. Personal health is influencing consumer trends. So it's no surprise that 90% of cafes see dairy-free alternative milk choices as a viable part of their business strategy. Can I just get a small oat latte? Now you can offer your customers a range of plant-based alternative milks crafted for coffee without compromise. Introducing the Alternative Dairy Co's range of barista milks, oat, almond and soy. They're uniquely blended on the central coast of New South Wales purely for baristas. Want unrivaled performance? You've got it. Want unparalleled taste? You've got it. And you also have the total support of our dedicated and passionate team. How do we do it? We're 100% Australian owned and part of the sanitarium family of brands. We're old hands at the Cafe Channel, opening our first store and cafe in Sydney over 100 years ago. We pioneered the way for dairy-free milks in Australia and we're the current market leaders. We're alternative by nature and celebrate being different. And we're passionate about quality. Our customers inspire us and we constantly seek new ways to delight them, making our great products even better and designing and creating innovative products to fill market needs. Our alternative milks are formulated for perfect balance and taste in espresso-based coffees and designed to optimally texture and stretch. We are now going to be joined by um, Rachel, who's worked at Sanitarium for over a decade and more recently launched the Alternative Dairy Company, which we just were introduced to then, which I hear is going absolutely um, The product is aimed at the cafe and food service industry. Um, and Rachel is a massive lover of coffee, a plant milk advocate with a major passion for the community. So we're going to hear a little bit about what they're doing um, to set up the business, but also a little bit about their community background as well. So hi, Rachel. Hey, how are you going, Joe? Yeah, good. I'm sorry about that noise. Then. That put me off a little bit. I was like, what was that? Um, can you tell us a bit about the Alternative Dairy Company's story? Because it's, uh, it's, it's relatively, well, I'll, I'll let you say it. <laughs> so the Alternative Dairy Company is a brand at Sanitarium. So Sanitarium is 100% Aussie-owned um, company, and you may know it from Wheat Bix and Up and Going So Good. Um, the really great thing, one of the really great things about Sanitarium is it's actually a not-for-profit organisation. So 100% of its profits go back into the communities in which we all live and work, which is really awesome. The Alternative Dairy Company was launched recently to bring great barista plant milk um, to the cafe and food service channel. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say it was launched in recently because it's um but it's popping up everywhere it's so great to see it's um it's it's come it's come out of nowhere but um why 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 did you decide to offer this plant-based alternative so sanitarium was actually the first company to bring um plant um milk to australia 33 years ago um and that was through the so good brand um and this was in response to consumer demand they were looking for a dairy alternative um and we started with soy initially Nine years ago, we added um, almond to the mix and more recently in the last few years, oat. I'm a huge fan of the oat. It's so yummy. Um, what was, um, so what, what makes it so special? I mean, just even just talking about the, the oat there, what, what, what makes it so creamy and yummy? Well, um, it, it, a lot about the process and, and everything, but what makes it really special is with both of our almond and oat products, our almonds and oats are sourced from farms in Riverina in New South Wales. So both of our raw material partners have really amazing, robust sustainability policies. So not only with water and for some of them running their own um, worm farms, but they really, really care for the bees and that's really important to us. So it's this commitment to caring for the planet that has really seen us build some really strong, strong procurement relationships with them. Yeah, the bees ones are is a, is a massive one. There was a report, um, especially on Californian grown almonds. A, a lot of the bees that are needed to pollinate the um, the farms, unfortunately, I think that's like one third of the bees get killed in that process. So it's um, and we all know how important our, our beautiful buzzy friends are for pollination and food supplies. So yeah, that's re it's a really important um, thing to note that you're you're thinking about that as part of your your your, your product. 
So have you seen a change in consumer preference over the last 30 years with with things like, you know, the knowledge that we have now around milk and dairy specifically? Yeah, absolutely. Initially, people were coming onto um, non-dairy products because of either intolerances or ethical reasons. This has really shifted, especially in the last three years. And a lot of people are now having it because they prefer the taste, they prefer the flavour, and they actually feel better on it as well. So because of that shift and that um, shift has happened through grocery and, and cafe as well, is now cafes are expected to offer a large variety of dairy alternatives to meet these changing consumer needs. Um, and because of that, uh, um, at ADC, we've actually worked really hard to make our products as neutral as possible. So they really complement the coffee bean. So it's all about the coffee bean with our milk. Brilliant. Um, and what's the next step for um, the Alternative Dairy Co? Co? I mean, it seems like you're, you're going great guns. What's, what's next? Um, well, on our sustainability journey, so at Sanitarium, um, we respect nature because it supports us and we're always looking way, for ways to reduce our environmental impact. So from water to waste, so in our Central Coast factory, we actually um, recycled 100, mil, 100 million litres of water um, to energy. We're making our manufacturing sites leaner and greener. Um, we're currently at 9% but working towards zero um, waste to landfill. So already reducing our 91% of waste um, by prevention, reduction, recycle and reuse. Um, and also our approach to plant-based foods, which Sanitarium is all about, we believe it's making a positive impact on the environment and lowering carbon footprint. For specifically the alternate dairy company, we're um, currently in the early stages of looking at a research to the full cycle and um, full life cycle analysis, which Adam spoke to us before earlier on. Um, and we're looking at that through our soy, oat and almond products. So we've get, engaged a third party to study the environmental impacts of our product along the value chains from planting the crops to manufacturing it in our factories and then to um, placing it into our consumers' hands and then disposal after that as well. So we're really excited about what um, we can talk about um, after we've done that, that study and um, we're excited to share that with you guys so you can um, speak to your um, customers about it too. And does that include your packaging as well? Because I know, I mean, obviously packaging yeah, sure. is such a, such a big one and Tetra Pak such a, um, you know, as much as it's a great product, a lot of councils don't have the ability to, to recycle it. And it's just, it's become a bit of a, an issue for a lot of cafes because they're frustrated with what to do with it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so would you ever think of going into a, um, a bulk product? Could you, could, you have, could you guys do that? Like creating some kind of bulk we're, we're definitely investigating it. So it's not that we don't have the capa um, capabilities now in our factory, but it's, yeah. it's definitely something that we're looking um, into the future for. That would be amazing. I'm sure yeah. I'm sure loads of cafes would love that. Um, and do you have any like messages for cafes across Australia about, um, you know, what you guys are doing and how, how they can kind of find more out more about what you're doing? Yeah, well, we are definitely the new kids on the block. We actually only launched about 18 months ago um, and we're really excited for cafes to try our product. Um, so we'd like to offer everyone to go via our website and I believe there'll be either a comment or a little somewhere, something with our link to our website to um, grab some free samples. Lovely. Well, I, well, I'm not a cafe, but I I'll, you know, could still maybe get a free sample for my morning brew. Um, did, you have, did you have anything else you wanted to add, Rachel? That, that's it. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. Um, and also, also for your support with, um, with the summit that we've put on today. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thanks, Jane. Back to you, Jane. A segue from that, as I said to you at the beginning, today's all about looking at the um, impacts of a cafe. And so uh, we, we've created a cafe series. We're calling it uh, Cafes That Are Killing It. And Joe and I have gone around um, and spoken to a few cafe leaders. So what we'll do is I'm going to show you another one. This is Lenka from um, Cat and Cow. She's the co-owner. It's a cafe in Randwick. And if you listen, you'll hear that she's introduced quite a range of initiatives that are really uh, targeting the um, environmental impact of her cafe. And then she links it to almost like the impact of, of her community or the people who are connected to her cafe. So have a, have a, have a listen. This is a great case study. I'll just share my screen. When we are opening the coffee shop, we knew that we can't sort of make the idea of giving away 
plastic stuff for free that will end up eventually in the oceans because anytime we go for a walk along the coast there's so much plastic and so many coffee cups. When Covid happened we unfortunately needed to take a step back and needed to introduce the uh, disposables but we tried to do it as environmentally friendly as possible with single use. We, we are not super happy about it but we are encouraging everyone to bring their own cups still and I would say still about 70% of our customers bring their own cups. Basically the disposable cups are usually going just to the new customers who've never been here and who don't know it. But we also have a composting service and we, our cups and lids are compostable so we tell the people who take the single use cup they can bring it back and compost it with us. Before we first started we wanted to make like send a clear message what we are doing. So we printed our mission statement that we are all about sustainability and actually do not use any single-use disposable items. Uh, so we put uh, little signs around the cafe on the front door so like when people walked in they already knew that something's a little bit different. Mm. Um, it, it has created this beautiful community. We have about 75% of people who are coming back. So we have like a welcome statement like, hey, have you ever been here before? And they're like, no, how do you know? And we're like, yeah, you know, we do something a little bit different. We are at Zero Waste Coffee Shop and we encourage everyone to bring their own cup. Okay, if you didn't bring your own, we still have the disposable ones, but we are more than happy if you bring your own next time. I think it works really well because you can like break the ice and so many people want to have the conversation. Just continue on like educating people about what we are doing and how can they limit their waste as well. But if someone gets taken away, we have takeaway charts, which is like $2 uh, deposit and you get a glass jar for your smoothies, for your virtue, for your granola. That's last jar so you can bring it back. And currently we also compost all our food scraps and all our packaging. We are using so all the coffee cups and all the containers can be can go straight into the composting. We are trying to not waste any food. So for example we are making carrot cakes with like uh, scraps from our juices. So we have like a pulp from the immunity juice which is apple carrot ginger and we just add it to the dough for the carrot cake. Now don't buy almost any single use cup. And the same for the kitchen, like because everything is like recycled cardboard or recycled paper packaging, it's the cheapest option. And we again encourage people bring your container. So we don't use as many of those either. So we are trying to use organic ingredients where possible. It's, it's not viable to do everything organic at the moment, but we are just trying to support local suppliers. Wherever we can, we just like try to get food in bulk and yeah, just limit the single use packaging. We can do recycling of our plastic, uh, soft plastics in Randwick Recycling Center, which is just like about 10 minutes drive from here. We just collect uh, all the soft plastics and then can recycle it, which was, I would say it would be pretty much the majority of the of the waste when we like put all the food scraps out. So it's our compost and then those soft plastics. And then everything else is just paper and cardboard. So in the end, we almost don't have any general rubbish. And our thin cost is, I would say it's less than $100 a month. And in like similar size cafes, where I was working, it was about 300. You know, so it's like a massive difference, even in the waste that you, you know, you pay for the waste management. So. So Marion um, is a French serial, serial entrepreneur um, and co-founder of the Compostable Alternatives, a one-stop platform making it very easy for cafes and restaurants to swap and replace plastic and bioplastic products with certified home compostable alternatives. Their products range focus on specialized material used daily in kitchens or for takeaways and break down anywhere there is oxygen and microorganisms in under four months. She's also the co-founder of Mr. Rye, Australia's first rye drinking straw grown in certified organic farmland in South Australia. What an intro. So lovely to have you here, Marion. We've been chatting for a while um, because it's just so great to hear about all the innovation that's going on in the cafe space and how we can share that with our cafe community. But um, I'd love to just take a step back and just ask you i mean i know what the problem is with um compostables but i would love to ask you what you think the issue is that we have in our um you know the market today for compostability 
Hi, Jill. How are you? Yes, good. Um, yeah, so basically, um, the main problem I've been seeing over the past two years for compostable um, products. So we've had a good, uh, we've got a fair amount of time to dig into the topic and really dig deep, dig deep into the topic of compostability. What we've noticed is that about 99% of compostable uh, packaging that are available on the market require to be disposed of in a green bin in order to be a compost and break down properly. And this is because all these packaging are only commercially compostables. So they require oxygen, they require humidity and high temperature, and they require to go to a composting facility in order to break down and become compost. The, the sad truth and what we've really um, looked into is that only, like there is 80% of Australian councils that do not offer organic green beans. So for those of you who are watching, um, I don't know whose of you have access to a, a green bean, but I can uh, certainly say that many of us don't have access to a green bean. And in that case, compostable packaging on the market can be a struggle. So that's mostly that's mostly the big the biggest uh, the biggest problem we've seen so far on the on the market. So you've talked a little bit about um, just their you know commercially compostable products. So, but are there their home compostable products, and and what what is the difference? What's the difference? Yeah. So as I said, commercially compostable products they require to be disposed of in a green bin to go to a composting facility, and they will break down under uh, humidity, high temperature, and oxygen. Uh, that's the only. Uh, combination under which it will break down. And on the other side, home, compost pro home compostable products do not require such a setup in order to break down and decompose. They can be placed in your backyard garden, they can be placed in your own compost, and even in landfill, if the conditions are right, they will break down and decompose under four months. So that's the main difference between the two. Yeah, I mean, when you speak to cafes um, on your journey, do, do you feel like, um, the, the purchasing, purchasing decision makers know about this or is it or is it just something that's just too hard for them to kind of navigate? Um, I have to say, sadly, this is still a very big confusion on the market. There is lots of misinformation about these two different kinds of compostable products. And most of the time, people I've been talking to are telling me, oh, yeah, we're using compostable products. But then I ask them, but do you have a green bean where your customers can dispose of them? And they're like, oh, but it's okay, it's compostable. We'll put them in our landfill bin or in our recycling and, and that's okay. Which is not the case. These products don't go in recycling or landfill. So um, we often find that there is lots of confusions going around. Yeah, what well, if you send a commercially compostable cup to landfill, um, I mean, it, it, will gen it will decompose over time just like, stuff there but I've heard and I don't know if you know the answer to this because I'm just throwing it out there I've heard that they can actually give off um, more carbon emissions because they are used from they are made from a um, an organic product is that something is that something you can confirm so it's good in the way that they are coming from a renewable source and not uh, petroleum plastic so that's a good thing about all compostable products out there. However, for disposal, if a commercially compostable cup ends up in landfill, it would take quite a long amount of time to actually break down and decompose because the right conditions are not there for them to actually become mm. um, compost or to actually break down into nothing. So. I won't say it will be the same as plastic in that way, but it will take a considerable amount of time for them to break down and to actually disappear. And yeah. I'm not even talking about if this cup end up in the environment. That's another set. Of I know that's that what I was going to gonna that. say, because, you know, if, I, I know people who would think, you know, I mean, littering is terrible at the best of times. And you do see a lot of coffee cup litter, which is actually why Responsible Cuff Cafe started in the first place, really, to try and avoid that litter. But I think when people think something's compostable and they throw it in a bush, it's like, oh, out of their window in the car, it's like, oh, that's going to de decompose. It's like, no, that's just not how it works. Yeah. And I, I want to say that's mostly because of the misinformation and the confusion on the market, really, because on most cups, on most compostable cups that you see on the market, when you, when you read things like 
compostable, biodegradable, made from plant, not oil, you know, all these kind of claims that are written on the cup makes people believe that they're going to disappear, whatever, um, and wherever they are disposed of, which is not true. And I would say the brand needs to highlight where, where the cup needs to be disposed of. That's very, very important for their customers to, mm -hmm. to, to be able to do the right thing. Um, but I still think there is a big confusion around that. Brands, uh, brands well, really need to highlight how their products can be disposed of. Mm. I mean, the reality is, is a lot of people will, with the takeaway, they take it away anyway. So they're not going to be sitting there and then want to put it into a, a just like a compostable disposal space in um, a in cafe. Streets. Yes. So the the alternatives really are home compostable. Talk, talk to me a little bit about home compostable products. So the main difference with home compostable is that they don't require to be disposed in a specific bin. They can be disposed of um, in a normal bin. In landfill, they can break down under, like under, if there is oxygen and microorganism, they will break down. They can break down if they end up in the garden, even if they accidentally end up in the environment. And even better, if the, if the, the business has a, a compost or backyard, the cups can also, all the products, not only cups, can um, break down there as well. So it really removes that barrier of having to dispose of it in the right bin and it makes it easy for business and their customers to do the right thing without even thinking about it. So yeah. right now there is this really, um, I have to say, people need to really think about when they have a cup, which bin do I need to dispose it into? And people usually think about one second, and they're like, okay, this bin but most of the time doesn't go into the, into the right stream. But that's this one second that is really important. And that's why we want to make it easy with products that can be disposed of anywhere. And so what's the industry doing to try and manage this issue? Is there any, um, is there any labeling that can help people? So, yeah, so there is certifications. So um, uh, you must mostly uh, know about the commercially compostable certification. It's a seedling logo and it says compostable. Uh, so it doesn't precise commercially compostable, it just says compostable. But then there is another seedling logo that says home compostable. So these two different types of certification in Australia are really important and are a real indication of how to dispose of this product properly. But then sometimes these logos are not present on the product itself. They are on the, let's say, on the website that sells them or on the information pack that comes with the product. So it's really important to really look into this certification and um, for the, the range of product that we are, that we are offering, um, that's something that we really uh, highlight on our website. All the logos, the certification are really well highlighted so uh, people can clearly see um, how to dispose of them. But mostly that's only home compostable for us because we focus only on home compostable products. Yeah, cool. Great. So tell me a little bit about um, Mr. Rai in the background. There. Yeah, so I've put some photos in the background for you because I want to share my little story about Mr. Rai. It's, nice, it's a nice little story. It's actually the reason why I'm here in South Australia. I've came on the, um, on the entrepreneur uh, visa program that allows me to launch a business here in South Australia. And the business I decided to uh, focus on was how to replace plastic straws. So um, I came to Australia two years ago and uh, I wanted to focus on, on, on straws because they are a strong symbol of the plastic pollution. And I wanted to focus on using an existing resource in order to replace plastic. So um, I went to meet different organic certified farmers in South Australia and introduced them to the project and um, explained them that as well as our harvesting grains, they could also harvest the stalks and we would use them to replace plastic straws. So we're working with South Australian farmers and we use the byproducts of their rye crops in order to replace plastic straws. So on this side, you can see um, that's um, our harvest that happened in 2020. So we've got a vintage machine, this one at the back, that basically harvests the stalks, the remaining stalks from the paddock, uh, not breaking them, of course. That's a special machine that we found. It's a vintage ripper and binder from 1956. And we harvest the stalks, um, and then one by one, manually, we process them into drinking straws. We don't transform them at all. We just use the stubble, and the stubble is naturally hollow. I actually have a, a pack right here with me. I can show you quickly. 
So that's how okay, that's how a straw looks like. So that's simply the stalk part of the rye plant. And obviously that's a plant, so fully compostable anywhere. And because we work only with certified organic farmers, they don't contain any chemicals, any pesticides, and are completely food safe. So that was the initial ah, product that, uh, that we decided to work on. Amazing. And, um, Such a good innovation. How, how's it all going? Where are you at with it? It's, um, I call it a labor of love project, kind of, because obviously we've been working on it for the past two years and our biggest struggle right now have, has been to be able to scale up the project and find an automated way to process all straws uh, that is not manual, because currently we all do them manually, which is a lot of labor. Um, and also trying to find, I call it the magic recipe, you know, to have the best culture uh, the best soil regeneration, so we get the maximum productivity for both the grain and the stalks. So right now we're still trying to find out the perfect recipe in order to get good grains for farmers who are selling their grains and good stalks for them to make an added value of their crops. And um, and yeah, it's still uh, it's still on process. We've been uh, we've been selling uh, already some straws in 2020. We just launched a new a new batch uh, two months ago. And uh, we are hoping the next year will be even better with more product that we can process. Amazing. And so can you buy them on your website? The yes. So Mr. Rye is available on our website, mrrye.com. And for compostable alternative, we focus on a wider range of products. So as well as our rice straws, we also have other kind of straws, actually. We've got a, I've got here a grass straw that is also simply a grass. It doesn't come from Australia, that one. It comes from Vietnam, but it's completely compostable as well and works exactly the same as our rice straws. We've got a coconut straw here that we are the only one supplying in Australia that's basically made from fermented coconut water. So um, that's simply fermented coconut water, purely compostable anywhere as well. And we're working on other products. Uh, we were talking about coffee cups earlier. I haven't been able to find any home compostable certified coffee cups in Australia. So we set out to find a manufacturer that was certified home compostable and we found one. So we've got here a compo home compostable certified coffee cup made from bagasse, so the byproduct. And, um, and we're working on our launching other products that are also all certified home compostable. Amazing. I actually um, was at an RSL on the weekend and, and accosted a poor person working there because they put a, a plastic straw in my in my drink and I, I just blew up. I was just like, firstly, I don't want a straw. And secondly, why is it plastic? And they were like, oh, it's actually a compostable straw. And I was like, just be really, really careful what compostable means. Like maybe you should just really read. It, 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 it felt plastic. It was a bio. It was kind of like a it was a bioplastic straw. It was a PLA straw, probably. They look exactly yeah. the same as plastic. Yeah. The thing is that in South Australia, we've just banned single-use plastic straw and PLA straw. So PLA yeah, is really part of the legislation. And I'm hoping it's going to be extended to other products because PLA, bioplastic are just so confusing on the market. They look exactly the same as, uh, as a traditional plastic physically. It's really hard for people to make the difference. And, yeah, it, um, just, it was just ridiculous because this RSL was right on on the ocean, and I was just like, I know a group. A, there's an amazing group in Manly here in Sydney, um, and they they go strawling on the weekends, where they actually go diving and pick up straws um, in the ocean. And they've they showed me how many they found, and it's thousands of straws. Wow. Um, you know, and that's in Sydney Harbour. It's just you know, it's just so unnecessary. You know, firstly. Wow really think about, do you need a straw in the first place? Yeah. And then, um, you know, there's alternatives. So thank you so much for your time. It's been- No worries. About your incredible entrepreneurial spirit and, and keep up that labor of love. I know, I, I, know, <laughs> I know that feeling, I know that feeling, it's, but it's really important. And we, um, we hope to see more of the great things that you're doing in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Jill. Take care. And just as a final note, I, I noticed, uh, uh, there's a colleague in there who um, is very connected to organic farmers in Australia, Samantha, and I noticed she's asked you a question there, Marion. So maybe link up with her too, because she has a really great network of regenerative and organic farmers who might be able to supply you some more raw material. Cool. Samantha, look. thank you. And there. So you'll see that there. So I encourage you to do that over in chat. Um, so I'll move on now. So um, 
That was really interesting. And it was a really very much a very deep dive into what compostables are. And that really ends up our, our sort of planet side of what we're talking about today. But today was also about planet and people. And we really think that um, responsible cafes have a really tremendous opportunity to start creating positive impact in their community as well. So before we tease that out a little bit more, let me show you another example of a cafe that's killing it. And this one is um, a cafe here in Melbourne. And they're really, um, well, I'll let, I'll let, this is Tennille Gilbert from Home One. I'll let Tennille explain it to you. My name is Tennille Gilbert and I'm the co-founder and managing director of Society Melbourne. We are social enterprise cafes that are run to provide um, pathways out of homelessness for young people. It's in a nice little nook of Brunswick where there's a great community around here of people who are really interested in being involved um, in a community organisation and a socially responsible organisation. A lot of the time they're really coming to us because they know that they're getting a, not just a coffee, but they're actually getting coffee with a cause. So 100% of our profits from everything that we sell here at Home One goes back into our program to support the young people we work with. So we've had just over 40 young people go through our program in the last three and a half years and they spend about six months in our program so they go through a real step-by-step -step process and through doing that they develop those skills um, a lot more strongly and they develop really you know an ability to work in the hospitality space in Melbourne. Um, one young person I can talk to, uh, he had a really difficult upbringing. Um, at his first shift with us, he he rocked up two hours early for the shift um, because he'd never had a job before and he had just had no idea what was expected and he was so excited, but he just didn't know what quite to do. Um, and so we had to teach, you know, teach him all sorts of things. We had to make sure that he, you know, he got that punctuality right, that he understood no urgency and how do we make sure that customers are being prioritised in the cafe. You don't have to be a social enterprise to have a social impact. I think that's a really important thing. But there's definitely an opportunity for cafes who are running, you know, a, a business, a family business, whatever it might be, to also have a social impact. So one of the best ways you can do that is we run a program called Open Shift. We engage employment partners, so other cafes, other hospitality venues. And once a young person has finished our program and they have skills that match up with what you're looking for, we can then match you up as an employee and employer relationship and support you for about another three months to make sure that's a really positive ongoing um, relationship and that there's that ongoing employment for the young person. So although supporting young people to escape homelessness is our number one mission, sustainability and environmental impact is definitely a secondary mission and that's because we know that we can work as hard as we can right now to support these young people but for their future we need to uphold sustainability and an environment that they can continue to thrive in so they're really aware in our spaces of how we're using resources and how we're thinking about waste in particular so we use things like um, Reground, which is a coffee waste service which takes away that coffee. We also have worm farm out the back here. So we have basically no plastic waste. Um, we really try to eliminate that. So it's all a really important holistic part of the program. Um, and I think it really comes through because our, our team are so passionate about that, that it's really easy to pass on that knowledge and that, you know, those ideas about how we should work, if we're passionate, if we believe in it. So it's really just creating that environment where it's easy to have those discussions um, and where our participants are involved in the work that we do. Again, and I think another great cafe example, and I think the take home message there is you don't have to be a social enterprise to have a social impact. So that, that was a really, I went to visit um, to Neil and it was really great to see that. But I suppose um, just finally to sort of really talk about the people side of things, I thought I might just ask Joe a couple of questions and we'll finish off then soon to say in all the cafe, the, the cafes that are part of your responsible cafe network, what are some of the initiative you've seen around the idea of people and, and connecting to community? Yeah, I mean, Responsible Cafe started very much around, obviously, the coffee cup problem. But as we've grown, we've just know that there's so much more going on besides the cup. And some of the great things that we've seen cafes do is, um, you know, having a simple thing like having a book library where people can like swap books, bring them back. And that also means that there are people returning to the cafe. So it's creating that community feel and, and a sharing kind of sharing economy. 
um, you know, cafes that offer events, um, you know, some some around community events. So, uh, you know, if, if there's a, something that's going on in the community that they feel passionate about, like fracking or, you know, giving giving the space to the community to use it to to um, create more impact. Um, what's something that we've been really trying to push recently, especially after COVID, is um, a talkie table. A talkie table is where you have a, a table that either is constantly there or, you know, every now and again, you, you can put, we've got some labels on our website um, to say that that table is open for people to start conversations because there are loneliness is going to be become you know it is a it is a problem i know in the uk um the government is very much um you know make putting a lot of budget into loneliness because it does cause um a lot of other mental health and physical health issues so you know get, really giving that space to the community to say here's a place where you can have a safe conversation with a, with a new make a new friend so um there's also having cafes that can cater for the vegans and and the vegetarians of the world um um, and so what we've what we've got now is on our website is actually a, a rating system, which we're going to go into a little bit more next week. But cafes who are doing some of these great community actions, they can tick, tick them off. But it's definitely something that I'd love to grow as the um, as the network becomes more robust and, and, and more cafes are are um, or the community is asking more from from these spaces. So, yeah, that's what we're doing. That's great. Okay, thanks. That that really gives us a, a good overview of some of the activities that you can do as a cafe around the idea of people. So we've managed to go full time, even though we didn't have one of our speakers turn up. So that's an interesting um, thing that I will note here. So we'll finish off here today. And let, let me say that today we were talking about um, people and planet. We've talked about uh, purpose, procurement and performance as well. Next week, we're talking about new ways of engaging. And we've got a couple of really um, fantastic marketing experts from the PR Bravery PR Consultancy. And they're going to come and join us because it's all about next week, it's all about how can, we, how can we help cafes, responsible cafes, not only sort of record the impact, but tell their stories. So they're going to give us a whole range of ideas across different platforms of how you might tell your story. So that should be a fantastic session. We're also going to hear from Joe, and we're going to hear from all the different things that Responsible Cafe Network can offer you as a um, cafe to really help you on your journey. So next week is very practical and it's really about helping you um, to really take that action. Today, as with all the other um, summits, we're going to give you part three of our playbook. And so as we started, as, as Adam sort of described very well at the beginning, we talk about the environmental impacts of a cafe around three clear things, inputs, outputs and impacts. So our um, playbook this week is very much giving you some information around that. And in inputs, it's looking at energy and water, your materials and your transport. Outputs is looking at your waste and your emissions. But we also remind you to look at your impacts on land and biodiversity as well. So Joe will send that out as part of um, today's summit. Uh, next week, we also want it to be a little bit more in, um, interactive too. So we'll give you the opportunity to um, interact with some of our speakers. If you have any burning questions that you'd like to ask, uh, either speakers that we've had or will be there um, with other speakers next week, you can either jot some in now before we leave today or you can send them through via email and we'll answer them for you. So next week's all about how to engage, how to tell your story, coming together and interacting and having a bit more of a chat and an interactive experience. So that's it for today. I'll just say that thank you for everybody for coming. Thank you all our speakers for your time. Joe, I'll give you the last word. Anything you want to say? Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. I just would love to say that the power of sharing stories through through what you're doing, but also this summit is already taking effect. So um, we had a group of cafes um, contact me over the weekend who listened to Sarah Wilson's story, um, and they they really want to run a, a BYO Cup weekend. And so in true grassroots fashion, we've already created uh, a poster, agreed on a date, and um, yeah, stay tuned for more info. So, you know, there's the more that we can share, the more collaboration and the more, um, yeah, the, the more that we work together, we, we can create more impact. So thank you. See you soon. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming today. See you later.